honor for me to share this session with Rona Weinstein. So thank you all for coming. I remember the day I met Elizabeth Scott at Berkeley. I wanted to change my area of doctoral study from anthropology to biostatistics. I was seeking Betty's permission. We met in her office. I was young and I was figuring out who I was and what I would become. That day I was trying out red nail polish. I remember how uncomfortable I felt wearing it in front of Betty. It's not that she said anything to me about it, but it seemed to not fit with her attitude. Betty was welcoming, but she was scary and magnetic at the same time. I must have sensed that I was in the presence of a person who spoke truth to power. That was the last time I wore red nail polish. It was my first day as a graduate student in statistics. Betty's office was on the fourth floor of Evans Hall. One of the gems that I found while researching my book was an audio recording of the official groundbreaking ceremony for Evans Hall. The chancellor introduced Betty and then Betty gave some remarks. It was great to hear Betty's voice again. The chancellor said Betty had been on the planning committee for Evans Hall for almost 10 years and she was chair of the committee several times. Some of Betty's former students told me that Betty made sure there were women's restrooms on every floor. Betty had a vision of an increasing number of women in STEM fields. The restrooms for women were a physical manifestation of her vision. Betty had photographs of galaxies on the walls of her office. She had both a bachelor's degree and a PhD in astronomy from Berkeley. Here Betty is shown with her fellow doctoral students in the front row. And here she is, she is the only woman. Betty published many papers in leading astronomy journals. It's lucky for us that she was an astronomer turned statistician. She used her statistical skills to make evidence-based arguments to promote women in science. But Betty somehow knew she also needed a story to motivate people to look at the numbers. So she researched and told a story about how highly qualified women weren't allowed to use the world's biggest telescopes. At the time, the biggest telescopes were the 200 inch um, at Palomar, Palomar Observatory and the 100 inch at Mount Wilson Observatory, both in Southern California. Betty said this about her big telescope story. It is not often that one can point to something as surely discrimination. Usually we cannot distinguish between the consequences of our own lack of ability and those of an unfair authority. The surfaces of Betty's office were piled high with papers. Some were from her many research projects in astronomy, statistical methods, weather modification, biostatistics, and women's studies. These were the five areas that she worked in as a statistician. Other papers in her office were related to her teaching. I took categorical data analysis from her and she was supervising many student projects like my master's thesis. Betty was a thoughtful correspondent. She encouraged women who she thought were deserving. And what you're looking at here is a letter of encouragement that Betty wrote to me. Um, I just let some people... In this letter, she encouraged me to publish, publish my thesis, which I did, and she encouraged me to continue on to the doctorate, which I did. When Betty died, Bancroft Library took all of her papers. There were 148 storage file boxes in all, or 185 linear feet of materials. I'm grateful to Bancroft for granting me access. Betty spent her entire career at Berkeley. She rose from a research assistant to a professor. 
She was a founding faculty member of the statistics department. In fact, she was the only woman in a tenure ladder position in the statistics department for 22 years. The caption to this picture sums it up, alone in statistics. Because Betty was a statistician, I would be remiss if I didn't include some of the statistics that she uncovered about women on the faculty at Berkeley around 1970. The statistics were eye-opening and Christina mentioned one of these already. Um, 45 tenure letter faculty members were women. That's only 3.6%. 15 full professors were women. That's only 2%. There were only two women chairs, one of whom was Betty. So there was an article in the San Francisco Examiner that said, the university is not using the talents of the women it helps to train. Here are some more statistics from around 1970. In psychology, none of the 41 regular faculty members were women but 27% of the PhDs produced were women. In mathematics, the last time a woman was appointed to a tenure ladder position was 1953. 15 out of 34 or 44% of departments had not had a tenured woman faculty member in over 51 years. And out of the 100 highest academic salaries, none went to a woman. The situation for women faculty was, to use Betty's words, rather dismal. And as Christina noticed, noted, it had been getting worse. I had little idea when I met Betty for the first time that she was an immensely important figure in the field of statistics. I had no idea that she would soon become an honorary fellow of the Royal Statistical Society. These fellowships are awarded to individuals of great eminence. They are regarded as the equivalent of a guy medal in gold for non-statisticians. Therefore, a great honor infrequently bestowed. I had no idea that Betty was serving as the first woman president of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics and would soon become the first woman president of the International Bernoulli Society. Today, Betty has an important award and lecture named after her that is given by the presidents of five major statistical societies. This award recognizes an individual who exemplifies the contributions of Elizabeth L. Scott's lifelong efforts to further the careers of women in academia. Betty brought all of this statistical talent to her work on the status of academic women. Betty sometimes invited graduate students to social gatherings at her house. Her house made a real impression on me because the view from her front windows was of the picture perfect Claremont Hotel. Mm -hmm. I figured out that Betty lived with her mother. Betty never married or lived with her significant other who was also a statistics professor. Berkeley had nepotism rules where near relatives couldn't work in the same department. Betty, Sue Irvin Tripp and their advocacy collaborators helped to change all of that. They recommended that nepotism rules be replaced with conflict of interest rules. In fact, the early efforts of Betty and her collaborators resulted in 14 recommendations. These were written into a report on the status of women at Berkeley that was backed by hard data. The recommendations were meant to help women who were in relationships, who had academic ambitions, who were mothers, who were graduate students, who were researchers. They were meant to help women have equal status in the academic senate and in the faculty clubs. The report was called the most detailed and thoughtful study on the status of women on the Berkeley campus that was ever prepared. 
it had nationwide impact. It inspired many other university reports on the status of academic women. In 1970, when the report was published, there was hope. But three years later in 1973, there was a disappointing lack of progress. And here is the scorecard. By 1978, Betty knew that the equal status of women in academe would not be achieved in her lifetime. There was a saddle in Betty's living room. It was her grandfather's US cavalry saddle. He graduated from West Point, as did one of Betty's uncles and her youngest brother. So there were three generations of West Point graduates in Betty's family. Her father graduated from Annapolis and her two other brothers were also military men. Many were field artillery specialists, which means they were good at mathematics. It's clear that Betty had mathematics and service in her blood. She was even born on a military reservation in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Betty didn't have the opportunity to serve in the military, but she served her country by working with statistician Jersey Naiman on World War II strategic bombing studies. It was important work. It was said that they were contributing most of the new statistical ideas to the war effort. The work cost Betty some prestigious opportunities in astronomy, but her attitude was one of service. She said, I rather feel I should do whatever I can towards the war effort. I knew that one could request military service records from the National Personnel Records Center. I managed to get the records of Betty's uncle, the one who graduated from West Point. There were about three inches of records. In small print on one of the pages toward the back of the stack, I took special note of the person who Betty's uncle had listed as his nearest relative. The person was his sister and Betty's aunt, Phoebe Waterman. Phoebe's ad address was at Mount Wilson Observatory. This was a bingo moment for me as a biographer because it helped me to answer a burning question. How did Betty get interested in astronomy? To me, this was a compelling question because Betty spent her faculty life as a statistician and we all knew her as a statistician. This indicated that the whole family had a connection to the field of astronomy. I was able to learn a lot about Betty's Aunt Phoebe because Phoebe studied with some well-known women astronomers at Vassar College and Lick Observatory. Phoebe lived at a time when women were supposed to be human computers and not professional astronomers. Human computers like Phoebe did the tedious and routine work at the observatory, and they got paid little for it. This is Phoebe at the left with fellow girl computers. Phoebe wanted to do what the men were doing, so she came to Berkeley for doctoral work. Phoebe was in the first class at Berkeley that graduated women with PhDs in astronomy. But even with her PhD, Phoebe couldn't get a position at an astronomy, uh, at an observatory in the United States. She had to go to South America to work. Phoebe became an important part of Betty's story. Through her aunt Phoebe, Betty already had some knowledge as a girl of how hard things were for women in science. On the boat to South America, Phoebe fell in love with a German entrepreneur named Otto Haas. She soon came back to the United States and married him. Otto co-founded the Rahm and Haas Chemical Manufacturing Company in Philadelphia. The family is very into philanthropy. For example, they endowed an observatory at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in Washington, DC. 
And this, what you're looking at here is the Phoebe Waterman Haas Public Observatory. I thought about the Haas family when I was working on my book while I was working at the University of Montana. My department chair funded my first two archival trips to Bancroft. Each time I spent a week in the archive reviewing about 20 boxes. After the second trip, I still had about 100 boxes left to review, which means I still had about four or five trips to make. On the first two trips, I stayed at the faculty club because I didn't have to be a member to stay there. On the second trip, I remember looking out the window of my room, wondering how I was going to fund the other trips. That's when I decided to contact the Haas family. And I'm grateful that they funded the rest of my book project. For the rest of the trips to Berkeley, I joined the women's faculty club and I stayed there. This was special for me because I knew that Betty had been a vice president of the club and therefore was an important part of its history. But I didn't know how important. Another burning question for my book was, how did Betty become part of the Berkeley Academic Women's Movement? It turns out that the Women's Faculty Club was the place where the Berkeley women began to organize. So if you are interested in academic women's issues, the Berkeley Women's Faculty Club is hallowed ground. <laughs> I approached Sue Irvin Tripp after I realized her connections to Betty. Sue was one of the five authors, along with Betty, of the groundbreaking 1970 report on the status of academic women at Berkeley. I didn't know Sue when I was a doctoral student at Berkeley, but she served on my husband's PhD committee and he spoke highly of her. I did meet Sue in person when I was working on the book. She invited me to a Baroque concert, which she loved, and then to her home where she made a salmon dinner for me. We talked late in the evening about those times. I remember Sue as being a very kind person and fiercely intellectual. Sue was deeply concerned that the history of the Berkeley academic women's movement be preserved. I'm glad she was able to read my book before she passed. She liked it and she thanked me for it. Sue didn't remember how Betty became involved in the Berkeley academic women's movement, but she connected me with Herma Kay and Sanford Kadish. Both were Berkeley law school deans and intimately connected with the story, but they also didn't remember how Betty became involved. So I was lucky to one day find the answer in the 148 boxes at Bancroft. The beginning can be traced back to a woman named Doris Briggs. Doris worked in the UC system office. Martin Luther King had recently been assassinated and there were riots in over 100 cities across the United States. The UC president declared that the university should be part of the solution to the problem of inequality between blacks and whites. And he challenged members of the Berkeley community to come up with creative and constructive ideas. Doris responded to the president's challenge by inviting a group of influential women faculty members, including Betty, to come together at the Women's Faculty Club. And Doris called the group the Women's Faculty Club Study Group. Doris wrote, in thinking about the president's message, it seemed to me that there is no more vital group to tackle this challenge than the women of the faculty. You are leaders in your chosen fields and are proven creative thinkers. You also have special qualities of compassion and human warmth, which are so much needed today. This picture of Betty was taken around this time. Sue wasn't among those dozen women, and that's why Sue hadn't remembered how Betty became involved in the Berkeley academic women's movement. But Sue would become involved very soon. Today, if you Google Doris Briggs, you will find that she is remembered for her love of the railroads. She promoted, advocated, and lobbied for rail travel, prepared volunteers in California 
to provide education to passengers and received many awards for such work, including Amtrak's Champion of the Rails Award. Doris, the train lady, rode the train every day wearing her conductor's hat. But in her obit, there is no mention of her in relationship to academic women, even though she is the one who started the academic women's movement at, movement at Berkeley. She is the one who formed the group of women who met at the Women's Faculty Club in response to the urban crisis. And then Betty and others, including Sue, took the train from there. Always a researcher, Betty immediately formed some research questions. Why are there so few women on the faculty? And why are so few working toward and obtaining their PhDs? Later, Betty asked, why are women paid less than men with equivalent experience and productivity? Betty was well prepared to do this advocacy work on behalf of academic women. She already had a good portfolio of such work. As a new PhD, she had advocated to the UC Board of Regents to eliminate the loyalty oath imposed upon employees in reaction to the Cold War. As a new fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, Betty had advocated to prohibit, prohibit racial segregation in their institute. Betty had promoted civil rights. She helped to raise money for Martin Luther King's organization. Betty had advocated to the Berkeley City Council to save the Berkeley Aquatic Park, Park from industrial use. Betty had co-led faculty efforts to help the students who were put in jail during the free speech movement. She advocated and pledged bail money for students she knew and for students she did not know. Betty was one who saw the university as a center for research on societal problems. Betty was appointed to the position of chair of the statistics department. This was around the time when she began her work on the status of academic women. She was the department's first woman chair. The faculty club wasn't just closed to women being members, it was also closed to women attending meetings there. I found correspondence in Betty's collection where the president of the faculty club wrote to her and the other department chairs. He asked them to get their wives to promote an upcoming party at the club. <laughs> Betty was livid. She wrote back saying, you should know that I'm not allowed to join the faculty club. I want to tell you that this is a disgraceful situation. I am not going to encourage anyone to join a faculty club that practices discrimination. I hope that you will take some action. At their next meeting, the club's board of directors took actions to allow women into parts of the club where they had previously been prohibited. Of course, the Berkeley report on the status of women was just the beginning for Betty. She used her research skills to develop a number of reports on women. She became a foremost expert on salary inequity in academe. Her reputation eventually led to her being invited to prepare a report for the AAUP titled Higher, The Higher Education Salary Evaluation Kit. This kit is a tutorial on how to use regression analysis to flag salaries that look unequitable. It was used around the country to help identify women and minorities who should be reviewed by their administrations for adjustments in their salaries. One of her colleagues described her equity studies as extremely painstaking in their accuracy and seminal in their effect. Scott took what at the time was a non-conventional and controversial research topic, namely the status of women in academia, academe, and she made it her own. Betty's work on the status of women in academe is detailed in my book. While I was writing the book, I tried very hard to find the Scott side of the family, but I wasn't successful. Last year, that side of the family found the book and me. You won't be surprised to learn that Betty's nephew is a retired Air Force Colonel. <laughs> because he didn't appear in the book, I'd like to give him the last words in my talk. He told me after reading my book that Betty, quote, moved mountains. She was a very special person who changed so much at Cal and made a difference and I see continues to do so. And I told him that I couldn't agree with him more.
Okay, great. Thank you so much, Amanda. That's really wonderful. Um, and now I'd like to turn it over to Rona Weinstein to tell us more about the other colleague who worked on this, Susan Irvin Tripp. Rona. Thank you, Christina. Um, could I have the PowerPoints, please? Sarah? Yeah, PowerPoint. While I'm waiting, I urge everybody to read Amanda's book. It's utterly fascinating. It's one of those things I couldn't put down uh, because of the scholarship involved in painting such an incredible picture uh, about Betty Scott. So it's, it's really a fascinating uh, history. So here's a lovely picture of Sue. Sue was younger uh, than Elizabeth Scott, um, lived 1927 to 2018. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm delighted that she's honored uh, today alongside Betty Scott. They had a very close working uh, relationship. I'd like to thank Eleanor, Christina, and Mary uh, for hosting us today, Tina Gillis for this absolutely terrific series, and the 150 years of women's celebration, uh, Kathy Gallagher, Sheila Humphreys, and all the people who have been working on it. It's an unbelievable effort to chart the history of women uh, at Berkeley. Sue's memorial was exactly two years ago on this date here at the Women's Faculty Club, a second home for her. And in fact, it was her last visit out was here at a session that Saturday before she passed away. I first knew and admired Sue in print. Believe it or not, um, as a community psychologist, I began as a psycholinguist at McGill, uh, memory for the syntactic form of sentences, and I knew her work and Dan Slobin's work backwards. When I arrived in psychology in 1973, I couldn't find her in the department, and I was puzzled. As her colleague, I was hired in 1973 on the first year of affirmative action, and I owe my career to her actions. As Christina said, we all do. I'm flooded with memories of her today, of her office. When you went in, you could barely see her. There were so many books piled on her desk. There were books all around her on the floor. There were papers. She was searching for them constantly. I was in touch with her almost every day. Before emails, she'd come into my office, then daily emails, not even addressed, hi Rona, or whatever, a telephone call, she'd immediately go into her observation. Have you seen, do you know, what are we gonna do about? And then we collaborated together. And then the long trek to preserve her gender equity archive. She herself wanted to write the kind of book that Amanda wrote about Betty. She tried, she organized the papers, um, and all of her papers have been given over to uh, Bancroft. But she wants that book to be written, and I know Amanda has used some of that uh, material, but I imagine there's far more there that we can mine um, in Sue's uh, honor uh, and contribution. Next slide, please. So just a few career uh, highlights that tell a lot uh, about her. She graduated from Vassar in Art History in 1949. She received her doctorate in social psychology from the University of Michigan in 1955. And a sign of Sue's curiosity is she left Michigan early because the fit wasn't exactly right. And she went to Washington to study with others as her interests shifted. She taught at the Harvard School of Education for three years. She served as a visiting assistant professor in psychology from 1958 to 1959, and then was hired as faculty, I believe a lecturer in the Department of Speech, now Rhetoric, uh, 
from 1959 to 1975. She finally returned to psychology as a full professor in 1975, thanks to the efforts of Dan Slobin, and I'll say more about that later, retired in 1999, but was active until her death at 91, 60 years of service to UC Berkeley. Many, many honors. Among them, she was named uh, a UC Berkeley faculty research lecturer in 1994. Next slide, please. I was always curious about what shaped her unique activism. She was tall, statuesque, a beautiful woman. And I wondered what made her so bold. And when you look into her own history, you see the ingredients, I think, of her early years. She had a Midwestern grit. She was born in Minneapolis, youngest of two children with an older brother to college educated parents with maternal family ties to Vassar and an aunt with a career whom she admired. She was never locked into gender roles. She was taught by her father to fish in a nearby lake every summer and to fix things. She received an all girls education in high school and at Vassar, where as she put it, she was encouraged to be smart. And she showed early activism. She published a defense of Cubism and Picasso at age 13 in the Minneapolis Star-Ledger, and she worked on Henry Wallace's 1948 presidential campaign in her senior year. And most impressive, and the family showed pictures at her memorial, she, she drove alone across the country in a Rambler convertible, camping in the fields, and abandoned farmhouses, and this is 1956, for her Berkeley position. She met her husband, Professor of Physics Robert Tripp, on the Donner ski slopes. So there was nothing that would hold Sue back. <laughs> Next slide, please. She became a foundational leader in psycho and sociolinguistics and child language. And what's very interesting about her career is there were two pivotal intellectual influences and they came from her sensitive observations. One was a psychology course, a single course assignment at Vassar. Remember, she was an art history uh, major, where the assignment was to observe interaction between two individuals and to write down everything she saw. And she was amazed that three minutes of observation could produce so much information and understanding about human interaction. And in Washington, after she left uh, Michigan, she had a French bilingual friend who said that she felt differently when she spoke in French compared to how when she spoke in English, a phenomena that's been called a double self. And this absolutely fascinated Sue about language and its relationship to personality and, and characteristics. She was the only woman at the table in the summer of 1953 as a graduate student at the founding of psycholinguistics and she was to become a leader. She was a pathbreaker, a repeated one in so many things in the study of first language acquisition and bilingualism, in the early use of recordings using tape and video and computer analysis of dyadic interactions and language use and in the study of everyday discourse, particularly between multiple parties and particularly within a social context. She was very sensitive to how language changes in different social contexts and to gender roles. She was a beloved teacher and mentor and everybody remembers warm gatherings in her home. And I think what set these two women apart, Betty Scott and Sue Urban Tripp, was the research skills they brought to the study of gender disparities. So Sue applied her research skills to observing and documenting gender disparities. Next slide, please. She observed shocking gender inequities and this influenced uh, her involvement in the movement she, at Harvard, as a woman, had to enter through the side door. 
she was not allowed to march at graduation because she was a woman. And she noted when she came to Berkeley, the separate clubs for men and women on, on the campus. And most pivotal, I wouldn't say painful, maybe Dan might have a comment later. I, I don't know how much it pained her. I do know that she never forgot it. And that was uh, psychology's early failure for 16 years to see her as a suitable hire. She was told that the department had no interest in her field. So she was there one year as a visitor, the department let her know they had no interest in her field, but then they hired a younger male Harvard psycholinguist, linguist, Dan Slobin, who had not yet embarked on a dissertation. And he was to collaborate with her on an annual review article on psycholinguistics. Dan was hired via a telephone call to Harvard. Do you have any good men? After affirmative action, Dan and others won her return to psychology as a full professor 16 years later. And of course she noticed the few and declining numbers of female faculty at Berkeley. And as Amanda noted, um, Betty Scott's table sounded the alarm. And that really uh, sent her uh, on this mission to make a change. Next slide, please. So the women organized at Berkeley and there were only 15 tenured women at, at that time. And they formed this group, Amanda's talked about it, that they called the Women's Faculty Group. And spearheaded by Herma Hill Kay was the notion of creating the subcommittee report on the status of women through the Academic Senate. And this came out in 1970. It's a remarkable report. We've posted it on the web. It is the most extensive report of every aspect really that would speak to women's um, shockingly unfair uh, position uh, on the campus. One of her favorite tables was uh, the table that showed female appointments uh, on the campus. And of course, there were um, departments that had no women at all, but psychology had a gap of 47 years from its last appointment uh, to the year 1971, actually, when uh, Christina Maslach and Ev Eleanor Roche uh, were hired. She described in an unpublished paper three routes that were taken to bring women to this, this campus. The inside route, which was the use of university committees and reports and letters and nudging uh, of campus administrators. The government route through launching a civil rights complaint with the U.S. Department of uh, Justice and the legal route, a class action discrimination suit. And when you go through and look at the material, what you see is that nothing was won easily. And Amanda's table shows that as well. But multiple letters were written um, because the university failed to respond fully to uh, address these issues. And indeed, uh, the government cut off research funding for a period, I can't remember, about six months or more until the university did more to address bringing women uh, to, to the campus. So the report addressed and led to, it addressed nepotism and got rid of nepotism ultimately. It led to the beginning and use of affirmative action on this campus to the mid nineties. Salary equity studies um, that led ultimately after many, many years to real changes. And most importantly, and this is why I think it became a national model, not only for the good empirical work that was done, but that it recommended institutional structures and positions to bring about the reform with very clear accountability. It was data-driven, network-rich, Sue with her letters, seeing copies, was in touch with every woman leader 
uh, across the country, public reaching. Sue went to Sacramento to deliver um, testimony. Uh, the Berkeley Psychology Department is mentioned in hearings um, at the House of Representatives as having no women, uh, et cetera. So, um, and persistent pressure. The women did not go away. Next uh, PowerPoint, please. Sue embraced leadership roles on, on the campus, big and important ones. She was chair and member of um, SWEM, the uh, academic committee on, on women and ethnic minorities, faculty assistant for women and an ombuds person. She engaged in policy efforts to level the playing field for women. So once women were admitted by affirmative action, she worked and I worked with her uh, together on opportunities to go half time. I found her notes to me in the letter for one year. I went half time in, in psychology. We together um, tried to create access to the implicit curriculum. We co authored a document under SWIM, but without our names. We were terrified and this was about 1980, called Advancement and Promotion of Junior Faculty at Berkeley. And um, this was to provide the information that men were sharing with each other, poker games, over beer, and in the men's room, as we saw in Tolman Hall, when they went in, stayed a long time, <laughs> and they came out together as groups uh, talking. Sue made me go alone that day to the budget committee. We were called in to um, be accountable for this report that was called heresy. Was she truly busy? Was she training me? I missed her height. I never felt so short. I had just been recently tenured and I was just reamed out. I've never forgotten it. Um, nine tall men, all white, um, reamed me out uh, saying that this is heresy, this has cheapened the meaning of tenure, and no matter what explanation I made, um, I could not satisfy. So we got great pleasure out of the fact that this was put on the web and this became the material that helped both men and women, ethnic minorities, and, and others prepare for the tenure process, think about the issues involved um, in developing their work. And I think one of the ways Berkeley leaded and Sue uh, led and Sue was part of it is that ultimately through these arguments, um, both men and women were given these opportunities. So I remember at that budget committee meeting, I was told that women would get ahead if they had, um, this was a, another issue that, that I worked on. I was the first case to stop the clock. And I argued uh, with members of the budget committee that women would be get ahead. Well, women are not gonna get ahead when they're changing diapers, when they're recovering from giving birth, et cetera. But I think ultimately one of the changes came about we're recognizing that men wanted to be involved in child rearing and child care, and that these policies offered a fairer level playing ground for both. Um, Sue was the voice of conscience on the Berkeley campus. Some might call her a nudge, and she <laughs> did nudge, but she was the true moral compass of the campus with regard to equity. And she kept this incredible archive from the late 60s well into the 90s, and it included cases where she helped women who did not get tenure um, or not doing well reverse their experience at, at Berkeley. And she was a member of the Women's Faculty Forum that we began in psychology, a next generation, a 21st century uh, network. Next slide, please. So what's her equity legacy. Um, we all, the women here today, owe our positions and a more equitable playing field to Sue, Betty Scott, and others. And her dream of gender parity was achieved in psychology. 
not, not in every department on the campus, and female leadership at the top was achieved with our first female um, chancellor, Carol Christ. She also anticipated the next era of sexism in academe and worked on those issues as uh, an ombudsperson on sexual harassment. She did a study, her own study, on bias in evaluations. She looked at, it was never published, but I believe all the records uh, are there of this study in her archive, the adjectives used when women were described and when men were described. And now there are experimental studies that show those differences. And she anticipated the power dynamics in the differential allocation of resources, rewards, and status. She left us a remarkable oral history, I urge you to read it, and an archive of the gender equity struggle, rich examples of efforts undertaken, and also reports of the time. So she cut out newspaper articles. She has reports from multiple universities. So the documents of the time, uh, I think, are very important uh, to capture. It's ripe for analysis, and I hope by publicizing her role, we can bring some attention and a historian of science and gender equity might step up to the plate uh, to write a book like Amanda <laughs> wrote. Sue achieved all of this, her scholarship and her activism hand in hand with a full and loving life in her marriage as mother of three plus two with daughters-in-law, grandmother of three and many academic children. As I was preparing this talk, I was struck by how many women in previous generations, the few that were on the campus had to give up this access to marriage, uh, to having children. And Sue did it without the supports that are now um, in place. And I wondered, um, Sue had her children during the years she was in rhetoric, um, speech and then became rhetoric. And I wondered how she would have fared in the psychology department at that time. Rhetoric didn't have a graduate program. It may have been a more hospitable environment. I wish I could have asked Sue about that, to have her family there, and she moved with family intact to a full professorship in psychology in 1975. Next slide, please. So here's a picture of our women's faculty forum in psychology. And Sue is in uh, the front row. I'm sitting uh, beside her. It was taken by Francis Katsura, our administrator, in 2013. And it, it shows really um, what Sue built uh, in the change that took place uh, in our department. Next uh, slide, please. I want to share this quote by her dear colleague, uh, Dan, who, who wrote in the preface to Sue's oral history in 2016. This is how he described her life. One might look at her, Sue's life story, as a continuing concern for the contexts in which human beings learn and interact, permeated by a deeply felt moral imperative to remove obstacles to growth and development and a pervading sense of justice and fair play. Beautiful words, and I think it captures her whole life, both in her scholarship and in her work on gender equity. We at UC Berkeley are forever grateful for the legacy Susan Irvin Tripp left our campus, opening the door for women faculty to take their rightful place as scholars, teachers, and in public service to nurture future generations and to improve the world we share. Next slide. And these are some of the resources that are available. Um, to see and understand Sue's work, that paper in 1995, which is, describes what she did and others did, Dan Sloban and others, Festschrift book in honor of her work, her oral history conducted by Shanna Farrell, and then a very long obituary 
um, that traces her work uh, in social context um, and language. Thank you for letting us tell the story of these two remarkable women who changed Berkeley and I would say the country in terms of access to women to having a full and rich career. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Rona. And Amanda both. I wish, can we all clap and unmute ourselves or something like this? I think that was wonderful. Um, we, we have time for questions. Uh, and if I can uh, uh, take a little precedence here as the, as the moderator, I just wanted to bring out one point and ask both Amanda and Rona if, they, if any of their work covers some of this. And that is that if you take the report in 1970, known as the Blue Book, because it was published as a little sort of blue pamphlet, uh, and you look at the data on how long departments had gone without hiring women at all, or how long it had been since their last hire, and you compare that with what came out in the press at the time, and I was a graduate student trying to you know, uh, get ready to, to go interview for jobs, and I remember it was from the press that I heard about that Berkeley didn't have women in psychology for you know, 47 years. And it was like, what, how could that be? And what the remarkable thing was, and I don't know who did this um, or whether the committee, whether the group, um, but essentially it was changing the way the statistics were presented. If you read the blue book, you really have to search and it's all sort of alphabetical and little type and you have to go through and kind of see if you can see a pattern or you know, what's going on. In the press, they had two lists. One list was the Zero Club. And here was all the departments that had never ever hired women in, as faculty, tenure track faculty at Berkeley. And then there was a second list and it was, these departments have hired women, but they, put it in order of how long it had been since the last hire. And psychology came out as, in this list, number one, 47 years since the last hire. Sociology, I believe, was number two, 46 years since their last hire. And it just went on down to, you know. And transforming the data, the statistics, into that kind of a format for the public really, I think, was one of the things that sent sort of shockwaves out to people and to other universities because then you could see the data in a very different way. And I don't know who designed that, you know, or who decided or figured out maybe it would be better to make our point by putting it, you know, reorganizing the data and put it in this way, none and in order of how long. So I always thought Betty had some hand in, in that. And I, I don't know for sure, but Amanda and Rona, do you know anything about how they decided to publicize their data and their work on this and how they came up with that because it really was remarkable. Um, I, I could say, I don't know the exact answer to your question, but um, I do know that Betty uh, talked to the press and, I, and she wasn't shy about it. <laughs> I imagine, yes. Yeah, and she, you know, she talked to the legislature. Um, you know, she talked to um, you know, women leaders nationally, um, Bernice Sandler, um, you know, so, so she wasn't shy about that sort of thing. And so um, if she played a role, I wouldn't be surprised um, yeah. Yeah. that she played a role in that. Yeah. Um, she yeah. was doing weather modification studies, which were really controversial also. And and there was a lot of that in the press. And, you know, so she had that kind of experience and, and um, you know, it was, I think, comfortable for her. Yeah. And yeah. I, I think that uh, Sue also played a role. I think Sue was very good at picking out the essential, uh, you know, ingredients. So she loved that table. I know. Uh, <laughs> table <laughs> for number three was her favorite table. So I have at hand her test testimony in Sacramento, uh, letters that, that she wrote to Bernice Sandler, the testimony. It's all focused on the big, the big picture yeah. uh, of, of this. So I think the two of them, they were not shy. Um, she, she 
was in protests. She spoke to the Daily Cal. She spoke to the newspaper. She picked up the phone. She wrote constantly and all those letters, you know, are saved. I wish in retrospect, I wish young people were interested in history. I would have saved everything she wrote me. Yeah. And, and I didn't. I only as I aged did I realize the import yeah. of that we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us and what they have done to make it possible. But her ar archive shows how they made this public. There is a hidden story and there's so, there is more work to be done. Yeah. And yeah. that is that some, the women were present as lecturers in some ways. So it wasn't that you couldn't see women, but they weren't in the decision-making meetings. They couldn't share dissertations. They couldn't hold grants under their own name. So, they're at, but men, as I'm writing the history of women in psychology, a number of faculty have shared with me, you know, when they made the observation, where are the women, uh, the women in the faculty meeting? Well, you know, they're, we didn't find competent ones, yeah. or if we got them, they'd marry and have children. And um, so they were teaching courses, but they weren't, they didn't have any power. They weren't shaping the fear. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting if I can just sort of share a little anecdote. Um, when I heard this, you know, because I think it was a brilliant move that they did to make those other tables that changed the report into a different format. Um, and I was hearing that psychology, there was no women in psychology who are 47 years and I'm thinking, I've been studying women who are at Berkeley doing developmental psychology. That's the leading names in the field. I mean, what do you mean they're not at Berkeley, you know, kind of thing? And didn't realize until later that they were all essentially research associates. Uh, I think there were nepotism rules. But I also remember, just as you said that, when I was an undergrad and trying to get letters of recommendation, people would say, well, you know, you want to go in psychology. Well, maybe developmental, that's the women's field. And, you know, women are going to just get married and you'll be taking, you know, a position of a, a man who could get the degree and go on to a job. So I was even discouraged at that point. So there was something clearly more broadly, I think, culturally going on at that time that even when we think about, oh my gosh, things were changing, I think we were still, it was the 50s going forward and women uh, not being in, in the workplace and so forth. So it was interesting. But I think that that move that they made on how they presented that data, because if you read the blue book, you don't get the same picture. It's there, but it's embedded. Hidden figures, essentially, kind of thing. And the way when they translated it into a form that everybody could see really clearly what the, the big picture was, I, it was just a really brilliant move. Um, one other question I just wanted to, to raise um, with Amanda. Could you say a little bit about what got you started writing a book about Betty Scott? I mean, you know, given your own career and all the kind of things you're doing. How, I mean, yeah. where, where did that begin? It's not something that biostatisticians usually do. Um, <laughs> yes. But uh, I, I, I had done a series of uh, appointments in academic administration and uh, was, was facing a position in the faculty. And so I knew I had um, a, a more time uh, and, and enough time to do a large project. And so, you know, I, I was remembering back about Elizabeth Scott and she was really kind of a one of a kind person. And, and I, I feel really fortunate that I, you know, was able to know her. And, um, and then looking at the, the books about women in statistics, I mean, all there is, it, all there was, was um, Florence Nightingale. Um, you know, so, so, you know, I, so I had this sort of time on my hands. And, and then I also, um, and, and here's where I was thinking back on um, something that Rona said about how there was a sort of a pivotal influence for Sue, where one course kind of influenced her. And I was remembering back um, that when I started at Berkeley, I, was, I started in anthropology. And I took a course from uh, John Holland Rowe uh, in the anthro department. It was a course on history and history and theory of anthropology. And I was, the, I was lucky, I was the only person in the class. And um, 
So he, he was big on using archival materials uh, in anthropology. And I can remember, you know, one of my assignments was to um, do something out of the material in bankrupt. So I came up with a project and, and um, you know, he approved it. But I can remember he walked me from Kroger Hall into Bancroft Library and hands-on showed me how to use the archival materials. Mm. You know, so all these many years later, when I thought about using those materials for this book, um, I knew I could do it. So. Interesting, right. Yeah. Okay. Rona, do you remember how you first met? Not, not found out about Sue, but actually met her and became a colleague? Were there any Stories you want to share about your early times? Yeah, I, I wish I did. Um, it must have been um, that she came to introduce herself to me. I wish I remembered I sought her out. I made the mistake, uh, as it was said, of starting a family <laughs> after just one year at Berkeley. So a pregnancy in the fall of the second year and the first pregnancy in the department. And so five male faculty members came to my office and suggested perhaps I might leave um, at this point. And uh, of course, we had no maternity leave. We had no, no policies at all. And we had a mid-career review. <laughs> mid-career? Mid -career. <laughs> Three right. years or less after to decide your entire career. So I must have gotten in touch with her or she came to off. She must have heard. Yeah. Maybe Dan knows, I don't know, but she came, a force, she came. I remember her in that way coming to offer her help. And mm -hmm. then any letter I wrote to the administration, any strategy I used, I ran by her and then we began to collaborate on some things. So she was vital to the parts of the level playing field I was able uh, to achieve. Of course, I had twins. Of course, they were early. <laughs> it got very complicated. Um, of course, I was asked to leave at the mid-career review. So there were many um, ways that Sue made it possible for me to stay. And what the other women did at IHD, and um, Jean Block in particular, was make clear, and this is what's so important, and that's what kept me staying there. This was an institutional problem. This was not a woman's personal problem. The institution was stacked against women. And I think that framing, having these women with that framing, and the women at IHD who could not get a faculty position in psychology saying, hang on to that position for us, don't give it up, was a prime uh, motivator. But she was there ready with editing, suggestions, contacts, people. She was in touch with the pulse of the country of women fighting uh, for women's rights. I remember that uh, I met her because this was before she came over to psychology, uh, but she was interested in women's issues in psychology and, and she came to talk to me about, was I interested as well in doing this? And I, and I said, yeah, I've been reading all the new literature was coming out, whatever. And we ended up co-teaching for a number of years, um, you know, a course uh, on what was happening actually in the 60s, 70s, you know, with women's, women's lib and all kinds of things that were changing. Uh, there was there was a lot of interesting stuff, so that was that was my initial connection. I know there are a number of people out there in the audience that I see who knew Sue and and Betty and may have some questions, but I don't see questions coming up yet. So does anybody want to chime in on a particular comment or a question for either Amanda or Rona? I'll just put that out there. Well, I want to, I, am I mute? No. Um, yes, yeah, you're fine, Sheila, yeah. I, 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 I mean, this was just a fantastic presentation, both of them really fascinating. I knew both of these women well, but in particularly, um, Elizabeth Scott was on the board of advisors of the Women's Center 
in the 1970s, which was my first job. And she was a wonderful advocate, both for the center, which was often feeling beleaguered because we were dependent on student reg fees, but also an, in a very important way, was a very strong strategic ally for the development of women's studies at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And the uh, people like Gloria Bowles and Bridget Connolly and um, who were really graduate students and they really um, you know, formed the first curriculum. And Elizabeth Scott was extremely, extremely supportive um, to them. In, in a constant way. Right, yeah, that's interesting. Okay, yeah. I think Al had his hand up. Uh, yeah, there. okay, yes. Here. Hello. Hi, hi Al. Hello, uh, I, 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 it was a, this was a, a, a wonderful set of talks and, and, uh, and I'm delighted to be here and listen to it and be educated. And when I came here in 1950, it never occurred to me that there were no women faculty members. In fact, there were three women faculty members who were very important people in the department. And, and, and the fact that when they disappeared, when Jean and Olga and Audrey disappeared, that there were no more really didn't sink in. And I wondered if either of the speakers have any, in the course of doing this wonderful project, have any insight into what was going on between 1940 or sometime in there and 1970 that resulted in the absence of women academics not just in psychology, but throughout the Berkeley campus. What was going on? Do you have any thoughts about that? Either Rona or, or Amanda. Well, um, Kathy Gallagher, is Kathy on? I don't, don't think I don't so. Think so. It has been looking into that history and she's written, the paper is in draft. Um, it soon will be posted uh, on the web. And one of the issues she raises in looking at that history, if I'm uh, quoting her uh, correctly, is that women found uh, faculty roles in certain kinds of departments, like home economics. Mm -hmm. So Catherine Landreth, who eventually came to psychology, her position was in home economics. And that was to teach young women how to become good wives and mothers. Now that, that field morphed into nutrition, became a science, household science, um, et cetera. And home economics ended as a department um, in 1958 or 60 or, or something like that. So she makes the argument that women were in certain places and had roles, but when it became more scientific and men joined, men hired men mm -hmm. and did not hire women. So the course of some of these departments changed and, and uh, the women took over, the men took over some of the, the, the things that women had, had developed. I'm probably not saying it eloquently enough, but she has a long paper looking at certain departments, how they began and, and where they ended. So Olga Bridgman, who was the first woman in psychology hired in 1915, was one of the four that started the independent department of psychology in 1922. So she was one of the, the four there. And there were tensions, if you look at our own department between developmental psychology, naturalistic studies, descriptive observational studies, and experimental studies. The women were largely being trained or were more interested in developmental psychology, but the department moved in a different direction. So I, I think there's something to that in mm. terms of the interests of women. And then Phil, do you have a response on that, if I may? Not a response to you, but I would like to add, I think 
that the war years played a part and that the men returning from the war were honored and hired in increasing numbers. And at the same time, this was a time of increasing traditionalization in the family. What we now call a traditional family wasn't so true in the 30s. It was, it, it was emerged again in the 50s after the women were kind of booted out of their positions in general, not academia, um, by the returning men. So there was a climate of women were to stay at home that was, was more than it had been. I think that played a role. Mm -hmm. yeah. At the time, there was a propaganda um, showing these latchkey kids. And um, so there was a whole government uh, effort to get women back into the home. Oh. So that, that was pervasive. Um, so I'd like to say a few words because I knew Betty very well. Um, I came to Berkeley in 1968 to work with, I had just gotten my PhD at MIT and I came to work with Julia Robinson, who was, I was mathematologic, mathematical logic. And um, she was one of the most famous people in my field. And everybody, including myself, uh, knew that her papers were signed Berkeley, California. But when I got here in 68, got to Berkeley in 68, I'm actually partly at Berkeley now too, but um, I was shocked to find that uh, Julie Robinson was not on the faculty at Berkeley, never had been. And um, that was uh, really uh, startling for me and that there hadn't been for years any women on the faculty. Um, so I, I think the faculty club issue was also very important in terms of development of mathematics at Berkeley. Um, Julia wasn't allowed to go to lunches at the male men faculty club, the male faculty club. Um, but that the logic group would meet every Fridays, I believe, there, and that's where a lot of ideas were uh, talked about at the faculty club, the men's faculty club. And she would always hear about ideas through her husband, Raphael, and he would tell her ideas, and then she would work on things, and then. So she was really um, several times, several paces removed from what was really happening. Um, her major work um, mm -hmm. was in sort of getting basic ideas for solving one of these very famous problems in mathematics called Herbert's 10th problem. And um, the, the problem was finally solved by a Russian mathematician, Yuri Mariusevich. But it was solved in exactly the way that Julia Robinson had laid out. She laid out a complete plan for the solution and she gave much of the mathematical ideas that would, would need to be put together. And he was, and Yuri Matisevich was the person who just took her plan and worked it out. I'm not saying, um, but if she had been on the faculty at Berkeley, that problem would have been solved by a, one of her graduate students. She just sort of laid out how to do it. She would have had many others. Anyway, um, short, long story short, of course, I was here as a lecturer, as most women who were cycling through. Julia was a lecturer also from time to time uh, at Berkeley. And I got to know, I actually read the 1970 Blue Book. And actually, I thought the data was really great. And I thought some of the stories, I think I, I I see what you have up on the web. It doesn't have the same impact for me as that Blue Book, which I had. Um, then, and I got to know um, Betty Scott. So in 1971 in May, um, I wasn't, re so I came as a postdoc. I was hired as a lecturer. I had an offer for assistant professor at Yale and I was the head of the math department at Berkeley it convinced me that having a lectureship at Berkeley was as good as having an assistant professor at Yale, which I you know, was very naive and sort of believe that. Um, so finally, when I wasn't rehired um, in the math department, uh, several of the faculty, Steve Smale, Mo Hirsch and others, um, John Rose, were starting up a seminar series on um, mathematics and social responsibility. So um, they asked me uh, to run a session on women in mathematics. 
And at that point, I knew nothing about women in mathematics, except I I knew Julia, which she was probably the only mathematician I knew. And um, I didn't know anything about the history of women in mathematics or anything at all. Um, So, but I knew about the the blue book and I knew uh, about Betty. And so I talked to Betty and I said, well, would she be on a panel that I'd organize on women in mathematics in the math department? And she agreed to do that. I also got Ravenna Helson, who some of you might know, she's a psychologist who had done a study on all the women who had gotten PhDs in mathematics in the US during a certain period. And she did a study on um, creative versus uh, the creative personality. And then there was a woman teaching in history who knew something about the history of women in mathematics. So I organized this panel um, and that's the first time I heard about Hypatia or anything like this. And um, in fact, Betty did uh, talk a lot about this data. What I liked about what she did is she actually gave the data, but also the stories so that um, the numbers actually related to people and and situations. I don't think she gave names, but she told the stories. Um, So that possibly because it was called women was a huge, I mean, that was one, so we weren't in um, Evans Hall at that time. It was in this other building, which I think is the chemistry building, Vladimir, maybe it's that, one of the other buildings. And the lecture hall was packed because I guess it was kind of sexy to have something about women. But that's when I met um, all the women graduate students at Berkeley. And at that point, I became known as the expert (laughs) expert on women in mathematics. So I didn't know anything. And that a lot of the movement of women in mathematics with the graduate students at Berkeley started at that time. I later went on to uh, Mills College and developed the first computer science department of women's college. And I, I also worked with Sheila on a math science network, which I helped start. Um, and we needed to get data um, to get grants. So um, Betty worked with us on every single program that we did with women in STEM um, from then on, from 71 on, she worked on every single project we ever had helping us do statistical analysis. So we worked with her on that as well. So she worked also at the very grassroots level of increasing participations, particularly of girls in uh, STEM through the- Well, that's that's a great story and really sort of fills in a lot more about uh, Betty. So yeah, thank you. So anyway, that's, I'm sorry, but (laughs) I had to say something because she was a great friend of mine for many, many years. Right. Well, I just want to make sure because we're, we're, hour and a half or 5.30 and I just want to make sure if there's other people who have comments or questions that there's they want one, to make. One question in the chat in here. The chat room. Is there now one in the chat room? Oh, from, yeah. Nina. from Nina. From Rona and Amanda, with your knowledge of the past decades of struggle, what is your perspective on where we are now regarding gender equality and what we still need to do to achieve it? Either way, <laughs> you want to go first, Amanda? <laughs> Um, That's a a big question. Um, There's still so much more to do. Uh, We have a caucus for women in statistics, you know, they're still, you know, plugging away, um, you know, trying to get more recognition for women. Um, As of two years ago, in in our field, statistics, um, there had never been uh, named lectures after women. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so we managed to achieve that a couple of years ago. You know, it, it's important for both genders to be able to see women, you know, give keynote lectures, um, lectures that are named after women. And, um, you know, so that's something that we were able to achieve recently. Uh, there, there's there's a, a lot of stories still about women being treated as second-class citizens um, in my field. Um, a recent story from a few years ago um, from a friend at, in Texas. Uh, she was they they were her department was interviewing uh, a young woman for a position, and something that was said to her by a man just caused. The woman, the young woman, to break out in tears, you know. So, 
um, there's a lot of stuff that happens, I think, behind closed doors that um, that we need to know more about. Yeah, right. Yeah, I would agree uh, too that uh, we've achieved uh, many uh, good things, but we still have have a way to go. Um, until recently, the disparities in salary uh, still continue in many many places in psychology. We were an outlier, 28,000 difference at the full professor level between male and female controlling for lots of variables of productivity, etc. And that was addressed by the university. So Berkeley, on one hand, discriminated earlier and has been, I think, at the forefront of trying to address many of these issues and, and very responsive. What remains are these um, implicit bias uh, in, in, in how women are treated uh, in, in the field, um, in terms of how they're perceived, in terms of how resources are allocated, you mentioned Amanda, in terms of named lectureships, in terms of the history of fields. So there are untold stories about the fight, but there are untold stories about the intellectual contributions in shape, shaping a field. So it's still, at least I would say in psychology, somewhat of a male story of contributions. And I think the people working on the history of women in psychology are trying to address um, that. And I think there's some bullying and issues continue of sexual harassment. And um, there are also issues as fields become more feminized. So psychology has become more feminized, more women. And the issue is raised, is there less prestige associated then with fields where there are more women? So there is plenty of work uh, to be done. The good news, at least at Berkeley, is if you wanna have a family, <laughs> <laughs> you can have parental leave. <laughs> you can stop the clock. You can have transparency about your review. You can have uh, a look at outside letters, non-identifiable, so you can respond to criticism. Um, you can have Shelley Zedek was part and Angie Stacy a lot um, and Marianne Mason family friendly policies. So today women are working in a different um, place with regard to that, but those other problems remain. I might share one last story that I was touched by because a lot of the people who resisted women early on then were able to talk about it and talk about why they may have done that and how they perceive. So I, I got some apologies. And what I learned through that was how much men had to give up to have an academic career. And they had to give up a certain closeness with children and et cetera to make the tenure at so the level playing field for all of us, I think they're both sides to it. And Phil talks about the background of women's roles and changing family. The press today from many men is just share, not, not all, and it's still an issue, but to share in the raising of family. So that's, that's a last story that men have suffered too at the hands of the ways in which we have defined academe. Okay. I was well, gonna, yes, Amanda. I was just going to, I had a memory that um, I was at a, a, a conference that was put together for young women in statistics, uh, and this was a couple of years ago, and they had some breakout sessions, and, you know, the young women could choose, like, you know, go to this room if you want to be, you know, have a career in, in academics, and Go to this room if you want to have a career in industry and go to this room if you want to have a career in government and and there were not many people that went in the academic direction and and that actually kind of surprised me you know maybe because I, that's the direction i went in but it, it surprised me and so i i spent part of my time at the conference talking to the young women and asking them you know why did you go in in one of these other directions um and and they said 
that they just thought that the work environment was more conducive um, for, for raising children. You know, you, if, you know, you could put your kid in childcare, um, you know, you, you're done for the day at work and, and you pick your kid up, you know, you're going to be done for the day. You know, whereas if you're an academic, you're, you're never done. Um, your day is never done. So, um, so, so, I, you know, in a way the word's gotten out, you know, that, that there are, are environments that are more woman friendly, I guess. Um, and you can have, have a good career somewhere else. So I think that's, that's a problem for us um, yeah. because we want to attract the, the best and brightest young people, you know, to follow us and, um, and, and that's not necessarily the case. Yeah. Well, I think I remember, and Rona, you can, you can chime in, but I remember in psychology a number of years ago, you know, several decades ago, that it was distressing to see how some of our best female graduate students who were doing creative research were amazing teachers, you know, were all whatever. And when it came time to get, take their PhD, they did not go into academia and I would be asking them why. And they were saying, we've seen what it's like here, you know, how women have to, you know, how can you handle all of this and do these various things? And thank you very much. But I think, you know, my family and I want to do, you know, I'm going to choose some different paths. And I, you know, and again, it was kind of like we were looking at each other and saying, what are we doing? We, you know, as people here, you know, that somehow we're not, um, good examples of, of maybe being able to do, you know, the academic work and, you know, your private life as well. But um, yeah, there were some that I, I was, I was just saddened and, and shocked even, you know, that they would not continue given that they were so good at what they were doing. Um, and, but didn't see that this, that academia going to some other, you know, research institution or teaching institution would, would not work. So that, means a lot more sort of looking at ourselves in general and you know how do we create a better kind of environment in which to do some kind of work and still be able to have a a decent and and you know satisfying life at the same time and this is not just true for academia it's true in a lot of other places uh, I do a lot of work on job burnout, and we are seeing a lot of problems today, and particularly after the pandemic and so forth. The, the idea of a healthy workplace that can actually help people thrive no matter where they are um, and have a life, you know, <laughs> that they are, you know, happy with uh, is a big challenge. And uh, it's not enough to say, well, what's wrong with you? Why can't you keep up? Da, 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 da. It's uh, what are we providing to actually make sure that everybody can thrive if they come here? So anyway, I think we are probably done. Uh, we've gone longer than we often do when we're in person. So that's another advantage, <laughs> I think, of some of this. But I want to thank all of you uh, for coming and, and uh, raising issues and questions. And in particular, I want to thank Amanda Goldbeck and Rona Weinstein for just really wonderful, wonderful presentations about these two women who, as I say, are just terrific, inspiring, you know, leaders and role models for all of us. So thank you so much. It was really great. Really great. Okay. Mary, did you want to say any last word on behalf of the Women's Faculty Club? I would just uh, let everybody know that we did record this. As soon as we have it up, we'll try and email everybody when we are available to be, have it posted. And then we do have another Academic Lives program coming up. Eleanor mentioned on May 13th on um, Frances Perkins, secretary, first female Secretary of Labor, and Barbara Armstrong, who was the first woman appointed to a faculty position in a, law in a major law school. So those are, again, our two just tremendous women, and we hope you'll join us then. Thank and you. I just, yeah. Thank you. And I just want to say, I hope someday soon we'll all be able to get back at the Women's Faculty. <laughs> <laughs> and have meetings and lunches and all of the good things. And I hope you can see from the presentations today, and you'll hear again, a lot of important history took place at the Women's Faculty Club because it was built to house them, serve them. This is where they could get together when they were, in fact, being kept out of other places. So, uh, and it's celebrated its 100th, you know, birthday and uh, of its founding. So we are very, very proud of the club and uh, 
I promise we are going to have a lot more that we'll pull together about uh, what it's meant for the campus and for a lot of people. So thank you, Mary. Thank you, the Women's Faculty Club. Thank you, Eleanor, Amanda, Rona, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Mm -hmm.